Hello, students. Welcome to the final presentation of the final chapter of Business 121 Financial Planning and Money Management and to the final chapter of life death. <laughs> yeah. Well, <clears throat> it's all going to happen. It's going to happen to all of us. Well, maybe not. You millennials, who knows what will happen in 80 years? Yeah, the way technology, who knows, you might be living for a lot longer than uh, than you ever thought you would, which is a good problem to have, which is why you should start saving now, but we've already been there. Let's, let's discuss death, because <laughs> we've already done taxes, and we know that the two things that are certain in this life are death and taxes. But we don't usually call it death planning. We call it estate planning, indeed. Because what's left over after we check out? The property. What is estate planning? Well, your estate consists of everything you own. The estate plan is how you set up to administer and distribute your property during your life. Those are called gifts, legally, when you give something to somebody it, the IRS wants to know about it, depending, depending, depending on certain issues. Or after your death, and then that's an inheritance, a bequeathment. Estate planning is not just for the wealthy. If you own a home or you have children, you need estate planning. Now, nothing, I want you to listen carefully, nothing in this presentation is meant to be construed as legal advice in the state of California. Are you aware of this? Are you nodding your head? Yes. Because I am three years of law school and one bar exam from being able to give legal advice in the state of California. How long is law school? Right? Three years. Right? Do you, <laughs> I took business law a long time ago and my prof wasn't that great. Um, you're going to learn a whole lot more by taking business law here at Southwestern with Professor Shapiro or or Professor Levine. Uh, so, uh, yes. <laughs> and I've asked lawyers, friends, to read, to watch through this and see if I screwed up, but none of them have, uh, have done it yet. Estate planning includes both building your estate and, upon, and transferring your estate upon your death. Slide number two. Most people give little or no thought to putting their family, their f personal and financial affairs in order for the folks that survive them. At the very least, if you own a child, you need to talk to a lawyer about naming a guardian and then distributing your things, your estate, your belongings, your property. The demands of daily living can keep people about thinking from, from about death. Plus, it just ain't fun to think about a time when you won't be here anymore, is it? No, it's not. Slide 39. Plan while you're in good health. Don't, excuse me, don't procrastinate until some life-threatening illness or near-death experience scares you into acting. Estate planning is especially important for non-traditional households and businesses, unmarried partners, or happy, re I'm sorry, gay relations, yeah, same-sex relations, but I now... You get married, and you have all the rights and responsibilities of heterosexual couples, so there, there you go. Business partnership relationships. Remember the discussion we had in Chapter 10 on life insurance? Right, right. You better prepare for this, because people die from accidents, whatever, and you need to be uh, ready in the case of a business, business partnership, because you don't want the surviving partners' uh, livelihood to be threatened. Slide 40. Should you hire a lawyer or go it alone? Well, what did we say about taking out your own appendix? Get a good referral because a good lawyer can help you, folks. I know it sounds really outrageous and it is very expensive. But you need a good doctor if you need your appendix taken out. And you need a good lawyer if you're going to put together an estate plan. Now, there are two documents that we're going to spend time on, and we'll discuss them in detail, but they are the will and the trust. And for now, just know that you're going to want one or the other, and that's for the lawyer to decide. A will in the state of California is very cheap. It should be. If it's not, then you probably need a trust, and a trust ain't cheap. 
you still see advertisements for four ninety five, everything included, and I don't believe a single word of it. I expect to pay at least a grand for a trust. Should you go it alone, there are pr books, software programs, pre-printed forms, many, many internet sites designed to help you. The most respected is nolo.com, started many years ago before the internet by an, a lawyer who was just upset that people were people who didn't have the means were being charged outrageous, what they thought were outrageous amounts for legal help. And he said, you know, most of this stuff is just simply, simply filling out forms. So he built up a publishing uh, company to, to give people the option, if they so choose, and he'll be the first one to warn you, you know, you remember, you better, you better make sure you know what you're doing. Um, and if, it, if, it, if it's out of your league, it's out of your league, go see a lawyer. But then H&R Block, do your own will, Legal Zoom. I like that name, Legal Zoom. So go ahead, see how much it'll cost you if you do it alone. I'll go see a lawyer. Slide 41. What is involved in estate planning? Well, you need to create, review, update the will, the trust, all the other documents on a regular basis, especially if you get married, divorce, or move to another state. Now, there's a document called a codicil, which I don't know where they get it. Why didn't they just call it an amendment? I don't know. But normally when there are some life's changing uh, uh, situations and events such as marriage or divorce, you're going to want to do new documents anyway. You're going to need to an name an executor, and we'll discuss the executor's uh, power in a bit. You should consider creating and managing a trust or trusts, not to be construed as legal advice in the state of California, but the truth is that most all Californians would benefit from a trust once they are start to uh, um, accumulate a, a significant amount of wealth, and that includes a house. Prepare a letter of last instructions, which really has no legal standing, but it can be helpful and it's not a legal document. We'll discuss it in a bit. <clears throat> Organize current financial records and documents and let family members know where they are. Yeah, it's a cliche that seven years after the guy died, they found this life insurance policy or this stock certificate or whatever. And how do we do this? Well, it's actually very simple. 542. Remember the net worth statement? Exactly. On the net worth statement, at least my net worth statement, are all the phone numbers and websites that... My wife would have to uh, uh, take a look at, or whomever, if the two of us were to pass away in an accident, say, <clears throat> that everybody would have to, anybody who's going to deal with the estate, they have to contact these people. So your net worth statement becomes that inventory of your estate. All the financial investments, retirement accounts, real estate, business interests, insurance policies, any collectibles, let people know where they are, where are the titles to the vehicles. Where are the important documents, the Social Security veterans documents, mortgage, and all the other documents that you need? Add them on your net worth statement. Pretty cool. You do remember your financial statements, don't you? I certainly hope so. Slide 43. Now, on the board, when we uh, do this face-to-face -face class, I'll put the word will. <laughs> will in one section, and next to it will be trust. Because these are the two major documents that that you will uh, uh, be preparing, depending on what the lawyer tells you to do. The will, I love this definition, a legal declaration of a person's mind as to the disposition of his or her property after death. In other words, who, who, gets, the, in other words, who gets the property? Marriage and divorce will affect your will, and depending on the state you live in, it may revoke your will. As we said, if you get married, you get divorced, you move to another state, you're probably going to want a new will anyway, so talk to the lawyer. In the state of California, a standard will costs about two to three or four hundred dollars because that means you don't really have that much property and there's not a whole lot for them to do. Although I don't personally recommend it, I think you should talk to a lawyer you could probably do your own will without creating a legal nightmare for your heirs. All right? You, yeah, go ahead, do it. You know, use LegalZoom or whatever or no low. But 
I have the names of two very, very good lawyers that I trust who are well skilled in in um, estate preparation in Chula Vista, and they're both awesome. So, and they both helped us in you know in our travails and and our estate documents. So, uh, go find a good lawyer, folks. Slide number forty-four: intestate and probate. Intestate. Boy, that sounds obscene, doesn't it? Well, really, it just means you die without a will. But you hear somebody uh, say, well, he died intestate. And you think, oh my goodness, did he have his clothes on? No, it just means they never got around to creating any estate planning documents. And guess what? If you don't create an estate planning document for yourself and your family, the state does it on your behalf. The, the, the state, the state of California in our, in our uh, instance, distributes your assets. The state decides on a guardian for your child or children. And it becomes very complicated if you have a blended family, children from a previous marriage. Yeah. <clears throat> so, do you want to die intestate? Well, if you hate your heirs, go right ahead. Go right ahead. You, they will curse you, and you can laugh at them from beyond the beyond. And uh, But don't do that, folks. If you love your heirs, get the estate planning documents. Now, what's this probate? Probate is a process wherein a probate court validates your will and makes sure that your debts are paid. In some states, California being one of them, Many people will try to avoid the probate process by using a living trust, by using a trust, which is why it is imperative upon you to talk to a lawyer about which document you should have, because for you, a will might just be all you need, or you might need a trust alongside, or in place of, the will. Slide 44, the ex 40, 45, the executor. Who is the, ex not the executioner, the executor? This is the person who executes the provisions of the will. Find out if the executor is willing to accept this major responsibility. Just don't name your brother or your, or your parents or somebody without talking to them. Because it's not an easy job, especially if there's any kind of property involved. Because this process brings out the worst in people. And who do they blame? You, if you're the executor. Find out if they're capable, if they're trustworthy. If you don't name one, exactly, one will be named for you, which in my humble opinion is not the best alternative. Being an executor is a serious responsibility. So choosing an executor is even more serious. Consider choosing co-executors, your attorney or a trust company, and then a friend or family member. So this is, allows you to have the best of both worlds. You can pay, make provisions to pay your friend or family member for their time, 50 bucks an hour, 75 bucks an hour. And so they won't hate you for having to do this for free. But my, you know, again, you need to talk to a lawyer because my understanding is that, oh, no, the courts allow uh, the payment to the executor even if you did not uh, make a provision for that. So you have to talk to a lawyer. But then the attorney will make sure that the important tasks are done correctly at 200 bucks an hour. <laughs> exactly. So you can run around and do all the legwork that you have to do uh, for, you know, for relatively inexpensive. And then the attorney, they make sure things are done correctly, the things that are important. And here is what happens. The executor takes control of the assets. They get the checkbook. You understand why it's such a serious responsibility. You give it to somebody who's not responsible, and they'll be just eaten alive. And they might get themselves in trouble, and, and the family's going to be angry, and, and who knows, and then the, then the, the, the accusations fly, and whoosh. The executor files an inventory of assets and liabilities. They have to sell any assets, if necessary, to pay certain liabilities. They then distribute the assets based on the instructions in the will and make it a final accounting to the court. They have enormous power, and there are countless stories of abuses of that power, so choose carefully. Slide 47, selecting a guardian. Even if you don't have much assets, 
if you have a child or children, you still need a will to at least name a guardian. Not to be construed as legal advice in the state of California. Because the guardian assumes the responsibility for providing the child or children with personal care and managing the estate for them on their behalf. So, again, talk to the people. Don't assume that the person you think is going to wind up with the kids is going to wind up with the kids. Put it in writing. See if their values and their child rearing practices match yours. It's your child or your children. So, at the very least, you need to talk to a lawyer about this part of estate planning. Now, let's take a little tack and on the board in the face-to-face -face class I go to the other side of the room and say okay these are documents that you know not necessarily estate planning but they're documents that can go along with estate planning or are separate but they but they're all in the same lines and let's quickly talk about a prenuptial agreement because what's the most important financial decision you're going to make in your lifetime who you marry right and so the prenup is there to protect you in the case of your marriage ending in divorce. Now, do people getting married want to think about the prospect of divorce before they get married? It's not something that people want to talk about, but it's very important if you have children from a previous marriage or assets or both, at least talk to a lawyer about the advantages and disadvantages of a prenuptial agreement before you get married. And if your would-be spouse refuses to even discuss a prenuptial agreement, that should serve as, as a disturbing omen. Don't say I didn't warn you. But if you're like me, who when faced with the prospect of marrying the second time, said, you know what, I don't want a prenuptial agreement because if this one doesn't work, I'm going to the monastery. And that's it with me. <laughs> it for me. No more property. No more marriage. I'll be a renunciant for the rest of... It, it, it worked out, folks. It worked out. It was great. The second marriage so far, so good. 28 years. Yes. My wife tells me to tell you that we are happily married. Yes. Slide number 49. A living will. A do not resuscitate. A, an, an advanced directive. Now, your, your lawyer is going to give you this. It's going to be thrown in with the package deal. And this is n not a will in this sense that we're talking about wills for estate planning. This is more if you become a in a persistent vegetative state. That's the phrase they use. It provides for your wishes to be followed if you become so physically or mentally disabled that you are unable to act on your behalf. Discuss your will with those close to you your living will. Sign it and date it before two witnesses. Give copies to those who are close to you because it requires careful thought. <laughs> Actually, it's a no-brainer. <laughs> oh, sorry, I could not help myself. I don't know if you remember, but about ten years ago there was a, a little over ten years ago now, there was a widely um, uh, publicized uh, event in Florida where a gentleman and his wife, um, his wife had been in a, uh, were involved, and the parents of the wife. The wife had been in a persistent vegetative state for, I think, 16 years, and the doctors were pretty darn sure that this woman was never coming out of the coma, and she had not signed an advance directive and a living will, a pull the plug document, whatever you want to call it. And so the, the husband had to go through this process of saying, yes, you know, we've, we are pretty sure that she would, her wishes would have been that if she were in this state for so long, that she would have been okay with it. And he's got the final world. They're married. Well, the parents got frantic and said, you can't let her go. And so it became a cause celeb and the politicians got into the act. I don't know if you remember it. Um, <laughs> it was amazing. If she had signed the living will, no problem. No no argument, her desire. Slide 50, power of attorney. Now, you folks in the military, you know what this cause, is because they shove it in front of your face before you go on um, de deployment. It's a legal document that authorizes someone to act on your behalf. It doesn't have to be an attorney. It can be your brother-in-law or whoever. It, it can be limited to just one item, such as a car, in case you want to sell your car while you're abroad, or give a great deal of power. You can give them your checkbook. 
Be very careful who you choose as a power of attorney because they, just like the executor, are going to be in control of your assets. The problem is you're no longer, you're still alive. And you come back and all the property's gone. Well, the durable power of, a health, of attorney for health care is the same idea but it allows someone else other than you to make decisions on your behalf for your health care, assuming you're unable to do so. So again, these will be thrown in if you need them by your a lawyer when you get the um, the estate planning documents done. The letter of last instruction, as we said, is not a legal document. The lawyer's not. Maybe if you ask them, they're not going to help you with this. Uh, if you ask them, they, you know, they might, but they'll just say, "Look, you know, that's, <laughs> I'm charging you 250 bucks an hour. Do you really, you really want me to do this?" Um, it's not legally enforceable. It just provides heirs with information. You should include your funeral preferences, names of people you want notified, the location and contents, assets and debts, and and this is where it can really help. You may have some personal effects that are of very little value, folks. I mean, don't send them through the courts. It just takes a lot of money and time up. But you want your uncle or your niece or nephew to get this portrait that you painted or whatever, some a, a lamp or some, you know, just little things that, that the, the courts just don't want to be involved with. And, um, it, yeah, I know nephew wanted this, uh, this little uh, statue of Mickey Mouse or whatever it is. And so, yeah, you don't, don't bother the lawyers in the courts with that. Sound good? Yeah, exactly. Slide 52. All right. It's time to discuss trusts. So, so we have a will, and we have little, the things about the will, the executor, and avoiding probate, and all that stuff. And now we're going to actually look at the document that helps us avoid probate, probate, and that's the trust. A trust is a legal arrangement through which a trustee holds your assets for your benefit or that of your beneficiaries. So it's a legal thing. It's, a, it's an entity that is created in the legal world. Like a corporation, but it's not a corporation. The corporation is you know, a, a company and, and that has its own legal things. This is a trust. This is a, a different legal arrangement. And it is a thing that you create in the legal world. It allows the trustee to take care or manage your property. But in some trusts, the living will, the revocable living trust, the inter vivos trust, you are often your own trustee. Huh? It distributes your assets to your heirs from the trust after you die according to your instructions, and that is done by the successor trustee, which is sort of like the executor. So you're gone, you're no longer the trustee because you're dead, and now there's a successor trustee to... to uh, distribute the assets according to the instructions in the trust. All, or the major assets, we should say, all your major assets are taken out of your name and put in the name of the trust or trusts. Huh? Why do we do that? Well, hang on a minute. We'll see why. But let me just add, trusts are tricky. Some people create them for themselves. You can do this, but if you screw up, your actions can result in outcomes that range from typically useless to present potentially disastrous. Now, what are we talking about, folks? I, it's a little hard to describe, and so if you were watching me, you'd see me move back and forth. You have these assets in your name. You create a trust. Okay, this trust is created. The Frank Piano Trust, or whatever trust, the name of your family trust, the family trust, your Piano family trust. And then you pick up the assets from your name and put them in the trust. Now, why would you do that? Well, we'll discuss that later. You're trying to avoid probate. But what often people do is they create the trust and they then never move the assets into the trust. It's called funding the trust. And this is where I think, I never asked, so I'm not going to find out. And I don't want to bother the guy or gal. But you'll see these advertisements for $4.95, everything done. Well, I think they create the trust for $4.95. But then they charge you, you know, three hundred or five hundred dollars to move the assets into the trust. I think that's what's going on, but who knows? But if you don't move the assets into the trust, you have not protected your estate from probate. 
That's why you shouldn't do it yourself, right? If you do create a trust and put the assets in, but you don't do it right, you can wind up in deep kimchi. You know what kimchi is, right? It's that stinky stuff, right? It's actually very tasty, but it smells bad. And you can wind up in a very bad place. And I'm not even about to describe what can happen, because I really don't understand. But there are ways you can put stuff in a trust so that you can't get it out, and it's stuck there, and now you're stuck. It's re irrevocable. I'm not a lawyer. Go talk to a lawyer. Slide 53. What are the possible benefits of a trust? Well, in the state of California, as we said, many people will use trusts, talk to your lawyer, to avoid probate. It can reduce your estate taxes, but if you're in this position where you're in danger of being hit by the estate taxes, you know you need to talk to a lawyer. It frees you from managing the trust. Someone else can manage it on your behalf. Or, as we said, you can be the trustee of your own trust. And it can also provide income for a surviving spouse or other dependents. Trusts can be extremely helpful for people whose children or grandchildren are either disabled or emotionally unprepared for a windfall inheritance. We will discuss those in a bit. Slide number 54. Here are just some of the different types of trusts that people use for estate planning. There are many, many more types of trusts, folks. But the most popular is the revocable living trust, the inter vivos trust, which just means while you're alive. That's why it's called a living trust, while you're alive. And then the AB trust is a cousin, and sometimes the two of them are mixed up. I'm not a lawyer. I don't understand how it works. Uh, the generation skipping trust. isn't. I mean, that makes sense, doesn't it? You skip a generation. But what does the spendthrift trust mean? Or a private annuity trust? That, that might be the one you need. You don't know that. You need to talk to a lawyer. Don't do it. <laughs> I don't care what legal Zoom says. You can do your own trust. Don't do it. Slide 55. California and living trust. The revocable living trust, the inter vivos trusts, are very common in California and they are used to avoid probate and it sometimes reduces the estate taxes. If you're a California resident who owns property or has any substantial net worth, your estate will most likely benefit from some sort of living trust. Not to be construed as a legal advice, go talk to a lawyer. As we said, you're going to spend about 1000 to 1500 bucks. Please do not try to do your own trust. Let's say it again. If you screw up, your actions can result in outcomes that typically range from useless to potentially disastrous. Enough said? Okay. Slide 56. Here is why you're trying to avoid probate. If you have a home that's worth, say, $400,000, if you don't avoid probate, the lawyers get $22,000 no matter what. That is the minimum probate fee. It's a scam, I know, but the lawyers run the world, and Shakespeare said we need to kill all the lawyers, but that was a long time ago. And I agree, before lawyers, though, what? Yeah, right, pistols at dawn. I'll pay the lawyer $250, bucks. All right, I don't want to get shot at. And the same thing is true here. You're paying the lawyer $1,000 now so that your heirs don't get hit with a $18,000 or $22,000 bill. You understand? Because if you find a good lawyer to set up the trust correctly, the probate fees will be zero. Why is that allowed? I don't know. Talk to the folks in Sacramento. Yes, I know. We, we talk about tort reform and legal reform, but nothing's perfect, nothing's perfect, and in this case, it's far from perfect, but talk to a lawyer about why we need to pay $22,000 to somebody for doing a few hours worth of work, and they will, I'm sure, come up with very good reasons why it's a bargain. <laughs> Slide 57, <clears throat> federal and state estate taxes. Now, you hear about this in the media quite a, quite a bit. But it's really a non-event for the vast majority of people. Once you make, once you've accumulated over a certain amount, then the estate taxes uh, kick in.
some states have inheritance taxes. Not, not all states. California does not have an inheritance tax. And so to avoid paying these estate taxes, very wealthy people, folks, this does not apply to the vast majority of us, <laughs> would try to hide or move their assets before their uh, death. And the IRS and the Congress said, look, you're just trying to avoid the estate tax. Um, it's time to give back to the society that benefited you during your life. What we're going to do, here's what we're going to do. We're going to allow you to give a certain amount each year to as many people as you want and double it if you're married. And currently, starting in 2018, that is 15000 you can give $15,000 to as many as you want, any people as you want. If you give more than that, you have a choice. You can pay a gift tax, not the person who receives the gift, but you, the, the gifter, could pay a gift tax, which is basically the same as if you had waited till you were passed away and, and then, and then have, were affected by the federal estate tax. Or, and this is what m most people will do, you will reduce your federal exclusion to the estate tax. Huh? What? Hang on a minute. We'll take a look at that on the next slide. Does that make sense? You can either give the $15,000 starting in 2018 to as many people as you want per year, double it if you're married, or take the federal exclusion. In other words, reduce the amount that is going to be uh, hidden away, that's going to be uh, waived when you pass away. There are some ways that you can avoid taxes through illegal methods called evasion. What did we say about tax evasion? In this case, you won't go to jail because you're already dead. <laughs> the, the provisions don't kick in until you die. But you won't know whether they worked or not. And some of these things are life insurance policies that are sold by unscrupulous salespeople as a way to avoid the estate tax. Again, they're only interested in people who are very wealthy. We're talking at least five and a half million dollars. So it's not going to affect most people. And besides, if you really are that wealthy, you need to talk to a lawyer. You need to learn about uh, charitable bequests, remainder trusts and the like. To reduce the size of your estate, you get a double tax break before you die, and your estate gets a tax break after you die. Because if you don't, if you're very stubborn and you've accumulated a mass of wealth, which I think, you know, six, whatever it is, 5.75 million now this year, um, you, you know, it, <laughs> you really should talk to a lawyer, folks, you can afford it. But if you haven't, if you've been stubborn, you might find, well, you're dead, you, you wouldn't know, but your, your estate will have to sell off assets to pay for the tax. And this happens every once in a while, and the Republicans just jump on down and scream and holler because some nudnik never s owned a farm that's become very, very wealthy just because of the land, and then did not make a provision to put it into a trust for their heirs and they you know had to sell the farm and and that one time it happens in the state of nebraska somewhere the, the entire republican establishment jumps up and says see you see why we have to protect the billionaires ridiculous uh, excuse me i'm getting a little hot under the collar here it's uh, slide 58 now what is this federal estate taxes exclusion people don't really understand it but the idea is, look, you're going to be able to uh, bequeath a, a significant amount of resources to your heirs, okay? It started out, it was about $650,000, and it went to a million, and then started moving up from there about 15, 16, 18 years ago or so. And now, as of 2018, it's $11 million. And if you're married, double that. In 2017, it was almost five and a half million. So what happened? In the tax uh, cut of 2000, December 2017, the Republicans tried to kill, eliminate the estate tax. Uh, they call it the death tax. 
But instead, thanks to the efforts of one, one of the few re- moderate Republicans left in the Senate, uh, Susan Collins, they only doubled it. Eleven million. That's a lot of money, folks, to be able to bequeath to your heirs. I liked what, uh, what Warren Buffett said. I want to be able to uh, leave enough money, resources, capital, whatever you want to call it, to my children so they can do anything they want, but not so they can't do nothing, <laughs> so they can't sit around and do nothing. Yeah, like Paris Marriott or Paris Sheridan. I, I forget her name. Anyway, Winston Chiltr- Churchill, that incredible Bolshevik communist Yeah, right. Described the estate tax as a certain corrective against the development of a race of idle rich. It now, because of the $11 million exclusion and double it for for married couples, only affects 0.000545% of the American population. And I'm sure Mr. Murdoch is screaming, I didn't spend over 20 years grooming Fox News as a propaganda machine to be one of the 1,800 people who are still going to be affected by the death tax. Oh, well. I think this gentleman, Alberto Moravia, said it best. Of course, this, you know, we don't know if he actually said it because this is also attributed to Charles Lindbergh. But our Our ideals, laws, and customs should be based on the proposition that each generation in turn becomes the custodian rather than the absolute owner of our resources. And each generation has the obligation to pass this inheritance on to the future. All right, call me a Bolshevik, call me a communist. I don't care. We are all in this together, and you can't. I believe you can't have a race of idle rich and have the rest of us just sitting around thinking, oh, I guess the rich are better than us. Who said that a long time ago? I don't remember. Okay, so much for that political infusion into our economic and financial discussion. Slide number 59. Speaking of inheritances, (laughs) the greatest transfer of wealth in the history of the world will begin shortly. And over the next 50-odd years or so, we're looking at $41 trillion. And the amount of taxes is staggering because there are some people with hundreds of, well, not quite. I think uh, only Jeff Bezos is the one with over $100 billion individually. But still, we're talking hundreds of billions of dollars in the hands of a few individuals. And if they structure it correctly, like Mr. Gates and Mr. Buffett, you know, they're not going to pay a dime of estate taxes. Why? Because they're going to be giving it back to the society. Two-thirds of this inheritance will go to people who are already wealthy. So, oh well. (laughs) If you are one of the lucky ones who will be the recipients of an inheritance, of a windfall, how do you deal with it? Slide number 60. You suddenly receive 300,000 or 500, 800, 1.2 million, 1.7 million. You think you are now one of the rich and wealthy. You're set for life. Or are you? Well... The average Joe or Jane lottery winner whose life was ruined by winning the lottery has become a cliche. And I can't remember exactly if she was twenty if she was twenty seven or twenty four at the time, but there was a story and I wish I would have saved it. This is the bummer. I think sometimes I should save things, sometimes ah, I don't need that. But I wish I would have saved it because it was perfect. She won the lottery and it was the number was eight hundred thousand. And in three years, it was gone. Right. <laughs> she took her friends and family to Disneyland for a week, 45000 Now, you see, if she had taken Business 121, Financial Planning and Money Management, and went through Chapters 11, 12, 13, she would have seen that that's about enough to create $2,000 a month, $3,000 a month for the rest of your life. But no, she spent it all in three years. And what did she have to say for it? 
Well, it was a fun three years. Mm. <laughs> what would you do with a windfall? Well, let's see. Here is our uh, advice for what it's worth. Change your lifestyle very little. Be careful of acquiring a sense of responsibility for family and friends and even strangers. They will often expect you to share your windfall with them. A friend of mine that I rode bikes with for many years won 225000 I think it was, in the lottery. And the first words out of his daughter's mouth were, how much are you going to give me? Consider not touching the money for six months. Just put it away. Don't even, don't even think you have it. And find a trusted financial advisor. Whatever you do, realize that this is it, dear students. This is the one and only inheritance you will ever receive from your dear Grant Aunt Trudy. Don't screw under it. Hmm. Slide 62. The final instruction regarding estate planning. And uh, for Business 121, Financial Planning and Money Management, Spring 2018. <laughs> what do you think it'll be? The final instruction regarding estate planning? You got it. Go see a lawyer. Get a good reference. Again, I can give you the reference of a couple of very good estate lawyers who we have used in the past. So, uh, But then again, you know, there are many good, there are many not so good lawyers. There are many good professors. There are many not so good professors. You know, nobody's perfect. <clears throat> and we're all trying to be our best, some of us. Anyway, we're done. We are done, dear students. And now let me quickly, um, without too much emotion, tell you once again how incredibly honored and privileged and happy I am and all of us are at Southwestern that you have taken the time to uh, be part of our journey in Business 121 Financial Planning and Money Management because we sincerely hope that this class has been one of the few classes that 10, 15, 20 years from now, you will remember as actually helping you <laughs> in this crazy, absurd, joyful, sad, scary, bizarre adventure that we call life. Keep in mind that this material will, will always be in one shape or another of, of Available on wonderprofessor.com, assuming I'm still kicking, <laughs> I've been kicking, and who knows, your web presence often outlives you, and that we'd love you to keep in touch, tell us how you're succeeding, we love to hear how our students are succeeding. It is now time for you to evaluate me, right? There is a, um, a what do they call it, uh, it's a Padlet, a Padlet where you can uh, write your comments and your fellow students can read them. They're anonymous, of course. Um, if you are happy with what you have uh, uh, encountered here, please consider writing a review on RateMyProfessors.com. There's a link in Canvas and on the website, on, the, on the, my home website. I'm very uh, proud of those comments and work hard to keep them, um, you know, keep them positive. If you're not happy, please contact me directly. We will work. We will definitely take your criticisms to heart, and and I often uh, get very good ideas from the uh, the re reviews from the uh, the suggestions from students. Lastly, you know how I'm going to end. <laughs> Whatever you do in life, don't give up. Never give up. Yes, you'll succeed, I promise. And if you don't, you just start all over again <laughs> by not giving up. Thank you, thank you, thank you, all of you students. Uh, we wish you the best of luck and success in the future. <laughs>